I'm gonna get right into it. Um, oh yeah, that's perfect. Um, something uh, with regards to this was it was the Lord this morning as I was uh, pondering and meditating uh, with regards to patience, and it's and it's the one thing that I, the one word that would describe a female. Now, I mean, I'm talking about a mother, a mother who is has this attribute of being patient in hard times because that's really where the rubber meets the road. It, you know, the, the fact that, you know, it, when everything is going well, how do you handle pressure? Yeah. I, mean, I mean, everything's going well, how do you handle that? Mm -hmm. It's pretty easy. But when pressure comes, how do you handle the pressure? And it, it is something that I, I am aware of regarding life, period. God, if, if anyone is patient, God is patient with us. Yeah. <laughs> because we are all a work in progress. Amen. We are all a work in progress. And here's what I have here. Um, David speaks of, of a requirement. We talked about this a little bit last week. And some things that we need to have in place for us to be able to move up to the next level. Okay, so here's this, this is from Psalms chapter 24. And this is the earth is the Lord's, the earth belongs to the Lord and its fullness, the world and, and those who dwell in it. He has founded it on the seas and established it on the floods. Who may ascend, who may ascend the hill of the Lord? Who may stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart. And that's why I say to move up in life, because he the verse before it says, Who has founded it on the seas and established it on the floods? Who may ascend the hill of the Lord? <coughs> who can move up in life? Well, then he goes on to say, He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who has not lifted up his soul unto vanity, nor sworn deceitfully, he will receive the blessing from the Lord, and the righteousness from the God of his salvation. And I have these questions in the question form, just for thought-provoking uh, positions. Are your hands clean? Is your heart pure? Are you vain? Do you lie and deceive? So for to move up this hill, what must we have? Clean hands, pure heart or motives, selfless, integrity and honesty and this results in what the blessing the release of the blessing of god in our life because we're already blessed amplified says it this way he who has clean hands and a pure heart who has not lifted himself up to falsehood or to what is false nor sworn deceitfully he shall receive blessing from the lord and righteousness from the god of his salvation the blessing is hinged on its release based on these attributes, things that you need to do. Daniel's integrity was challenged by King Nebuchadnezzar. And this is where, we're, we, are, where we are in our day today. Many times we're confronted with some of the um, decisions that are made for our country from the authorities that are in place. And because they are an authority, it's assumed that it's a, a godly decision that's being made. And it's not always a godly decision. Examples are um, marriage between uh, a, a female and a female and a male and a male, or abortion, all these different things. Those are, those are the, um, the obvious ones. But there's things that are not biblically sound, nor will produce. And that's what God, God is all about productivity, about producing. God is not about us being stale, stalemated. You know, you play chess, you play chess before? Uh, in, in the game of chess, there's what is known as uh, a stalemate, meaning no one can move anywhere. Uh, you know, uh, chess is about war. It's about fighting. And you go in and you take out the, you take the, the characters out one at a time. Well, in this life, we are in a, in a battle. We are at war in our day-to-day -day against immorality. And if, and if we don't know what biblical standards are regarding moral standards, there are no morals outside of God's law. 
If it's outside of God's law, it's not, it's not immoral. It's called an immor immorality. It's not in line with what is pro productive. God intended for mankind to produce from the beginning. What did he say to Adam and Eve before the disobedience? He said what? Multiply and replenish. God is about productivity. But you have to start off from the proper image. And God is concerned about the way you think about yourself. And that's why it's crucial to receive Jesus as the Lord of your life. When you receive Jesus as Lord of your life, now that transition, that transformation that takes place spiritually has an impact on the way you think. Now what happens is that as the years go on, dependent on your commitment to your daily spiritual exercises such as prayer, the word, attending church, being submissive to a pastor. The, the whole idea behind the church, as it were, is apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher for the perfecting or maturing of the, of the saints. And, and this is not a man-made order. This is a God-ordained order. Actually, it's the head of the church who submitted this concept of having this type of fellowship. You come to a place where accountability is always there because everyone is susceptible to be deceived if we're left to our own, our own thinking. You guys check me as much as I check you. We are in this constant growth position. We never stop growing. We should never be at the place where we think we know everything. We have to be at the place of being yielding to what God has to offer us. Once we get to this place where we become all-knowing, then you become all-proudful and all-stubborn to receive information from that meaning. You end up becoming stupefied in your thinking and you don't grow. You don't mature. I have s s people in here who are way beyond my years, who have gone further in life than I have, and yet they're still learning and still growing. Look at, I had my father-in-law when he was here in the earth realm. Uh, he was submitted to me as, as his pastor when I was submitted to him as, his, as my pastor. Then he came under my ministry and was submitted to me as his pastor. Well, that takes a whole lot to be able to come from a place of being the authority and submitting yourself to someone that you trained up in the ways of the Lord. So... To say, to say the least, David's, I mean, sorry, Daniel's integrity was being challenged because of the current cultural stance that was there or standard that was being presented. So, this is what it says in Daniel chapter 1, verse number 8. But Daniel purposed, and this is that, that's that thing. Remember when we talked about Jesus, the, when, when, he, when Jesus told the Father, he was speaking to the Father, if, if there's any way possible that this cup can pass from me. Because Jesus didn't want to be separated from God. He didn't want to be separated from his Father. He didn't know what sin is. He never knew sin. He never committed sin, let's put it that way. But he could feel the pressure of the sin. That's what he was sweating, that blood. Remember how he was in prayer and he was perspiring blood to that extreme? Well, that's because he's never been separated from his father. Never. That was in a natural order. And it is that way, the, the same transition that happened in the Garden of Eden with Adam when he disobeyed is what happened with Jesus when he was about to be separated from his father. The same kind of feel. So, that being said... He said, Father, let this cup pass from me, but nevertheless, not my purpose, but your purpose be fulfilled. And this is where we as believers need to develop this stamina in the day and time that we're living in right now. You need to have some strength in you to be able to resist a lot of the compromise that takes place in our day today. A lot of Christians compromise and, you know, they do it in lighthearted things when they joke around. And they joke around like I used to work at a at a, a, a rental company, and these guys would start to tell jokes, and I and they were they were dirty jokes. So I would walk away from it. And so the next, I I don't mind a good joke, and I don't mind laughing. I like laughing, and I like good jokes. But if you're gonna start talking about personal female parts and male parts, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna rejoice with that. I'm not gonna laugh at that. So I would I would leave. But then so then when they would come again to say, hey, I have a joke to tell you, I said, well, is it a clean joke? <laughs> I gotta make sure I'll be opening my mind up to this kind of image. 
That's where you have to have the boldness. If someone is bold enough, there, there, guys, there will be guys that will be cussing up a storm, using all kinds of foul language, F this and mother F and da 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 da. And so I would just say, yell out, praise the Lord, hallelujah, God is good, thank you, Jesus. And everything gets quiet. <laughs> they stop using that foul language. Well, hey, if, if they have the boldness to speak out all this stuff, and that's, that's from a lighthearted position. But in our day today, there's so much out there that Christians are being pushed out away from what they believe. You got to be woman enough and man enough to stand your ground. So in this case, this is what happened with Daniel. So this didn't just happen overnight or just happen in our day today. This is stuff that's been going on for years. Political pressure. But Daniel purposed in his heart that he would not defile himself with the portion of the king's food, nor with the wine which he drank. Therefore, he requested of the master of the officials that he might not defile himself. Daniel resolved. This is what the English Standard Version says. But Daniel resolved, and I like that phrase, you know, like purposed. But he made, came to a resolve within himself that I'm not going to back off. I'm going to stand my ground. I'm going to do what I know is honorable to God. To God. He says, but Daniel resolved that he would not defile himself with the king's food or with the wine that he drank. Therefore, he asked the chief of the eunuchs to allow him not to defile himself. We're going to emphasize on this word defile. And this is what it means from the, uh, uh, the, Greek, uh, the Hebrew. Defile means unfit, unhealthy, polluted, defilement of religious character and moral spiritual impurity, a sinful and unfit condition. I'm going to give you a little bit more to this that the Spirit of God gave me. And this is going to be from the Dictionary of Gilbert. <laughs> so let's break this word down, okay? Defile. If, when we break it apart, we have the prefix D, which means from or off. And the word file, which means to place items or information in a file. So if you di dissect a word, you, you get its origin and how it was used, right? We all have mental files filled with data and information. Dr. Caroline Leaf assessed that the mind is capable of over three trillion years of data. And when you think about data, you think about what? Files. A file. Files. Yeah. You think of files of information in all of us. Even there's some files that you don't want people to know about. And they, they even have this in it when you're being investigated by the FBI or CIA or whatever, whoever's investigating you. There are some files that they have on you that could incriminate you. Why do you think they bring up all this stuff about the different presidents? They get into office, they start bringing up all the files of information that they have. I'm using that as an illustration so that we understand what defile has to do with. Off. Your rocker is pretty much what it's saying. <laughs> Off file, <laughs> in essence. Okay, Whatever we have in abundance is what will manifest. And where is this abundance? It's in your mind. Okay, remember this. You are, a, once again, I am reiterate, reiterating this on purpose. You are a spirit being, and you have a soul, and you live in a body. You spiritually are far beyond the capability of your mind. Your mind is limited to what you put in it. So when we talk about spirit, we're talking about a, the deepness of who God is. Spirit communicates with what? With who? Spirit. Spirit talks to Holy Spirit. My human spirit talks to the Holy Spirit. And the Holy Spirit has the deep things of God within him. And this is where solidification comes in. Affirmation, security takes place within a person's life. Because now you're communicating with the one who has a direct connect with the one who knows specifically what, why you're here. Your purpose for life. Does God know why you're here? Does God know why you were born at this time and age in your, in where you are today, where you are today? 
Yes, he does. And you're supposed to be there. We are supposed to be here. We're here in this place. Why? Because this is what God intended for us. There's a bigger picture than just coming to church. Right? So whatever we have in abundance is what will manifest. So Jesus said it in Matthew 12, 34. O generation of vipers, how can you being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the what? Heart, the what? Mouth speaks. So everybody point to your heart. Right here. This is your heart. Not this. This is called a muscle. Right? We just learned this. We had some training on um, CPR. Today, the, the CP, CPR that you, that you do you, that's incorporated is uh, compressions, predominantly. You do still breathe, but it's predominantly compressions. And there's a way to do it. Well, see, that doesn't make your mind work. It makes your muscle heart work. <laughs> and that's why they're, you're, 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 you become the pump for them. <laughs> and you're going, right? At, at, at ha, 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 staying alive, staying alive. <laughs> right? So that's that speed that you're putting on in that heart. Okay. I, I had asked, and this is just added information. What happens, like, you know, because me pushing down like that, and I was pushing down on that mannequin, you know, the little thing. I said, if I push hard, I feel like I'm going to break the ribs. He goes, you probably will. Especially if there's an older person. But would you want their sternum? Yeah. Would you want, wouldn't you want them to stay alive? I said, well, yes, of course. And they may have a hard time breathing afterwards, but they're going to be alive. <laughs> well, the muscle heart is not your spirit. And when Jesus talks about for out of the abundance of the heart, he is not talking about the muscle heart. You know, that, that misnomer that, oh, I feel it in my spirit. Right here. I feel it in my spirit. Your spirit doesn't live in here, little, little spirit man. You are a spirit being. If you walked out of your body, you're my, I, I was, had a conversation with my sister and helping her to get an understanding of spirit, soul, and body. And, she, and her thought was, and because I mentioned something to her about her son, my, my nephew who had just passed, uh, that he's going to be resurrected. He's going to have a resurrected body. She goes, wait a minute. What did you just say right now? I said, his spirit is going to come back into that same body and resurrect from the ground. She goes, I did not, I did not know that. So are we going to look the same? I said, pretty much. Other, other than the aging factor. We won't have the aging factor. But you're going to look the same. If you came out of your body, you're going to look like the way, pretty much the way you looked when you were at your optimum. And, not, and if you were never at your optimum, then you will finally, finally see what your optimum was. <laughs> you're going to be able to see who you really are. You are a spirit being. God made us unique and you're supposed to be. Adam's going to look the same way he looked when God made him. Eve, for, we're talking about 7,000 years ago. They're going, to look, they're going to look exactly the same way. And anybody that's gone on before us, they're going to, when they come back into their body, it's going, to call, it's going to be called a celestial body. So you're not this little muscle heart, because your muscle heart is about the size of your fist. You're not a muscle heart. You have a spirit being. Oh, I'm sorry. You have a muscle heart and you live inside of this physical body and you as a spirit being are exactly what you see here other than the, you know, aging factors. <clears throat> Amen? Mm -hmm. Amen. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Okay, so out of the abundance of the what? Heart has to do with what? Point to your heart again. Here's your heart. Whatever you got going on in here is what's going to come out. Think about it. Do you always do what you think? No. What do you do? You do what you believe of what you think. And that's why faith comes by what? Hearing. The more you hear it, the greater now the information as far as your mind is concerned is willing to yield to what God says. That's why you got to get into the Word. You have to change the way you think. Okay, we, ha we all have to change the way we think. Okay, a good man out of the good treasure of his heart 
bears what is good, and an evil man out of the evil treasure of his heart, heart bears what is evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, heart the mouth will what? Speak. Speak. So whatever you have in this, in here in abundance, is what's going to come out. And you love Jesus and everything, but you, when the pressure gets tough, whatever you have in abundance is what's going to come out. Blessing or cursing? Yeah. And hopefully it's blessing. Yeah. Our abundance comes from a source. As believers, we must learn to trust the process God has laid out for us. And this is where the problem takes place. Because we are so trusting of our own process. And many times, as, as, as Proverbs chapter 14, verse 12 says, he says, there's a way that seems right to a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Why go to church? Do we, I mean, you know, hey, we are the church. So why go to church? We don't need to go to church. We don't need to submit ourselves to church. We don't need to sit under a pastor. I will teach you. I will be your pastor. <laughs> and that, which is, I mean, you, you're going to be growing together. That's normal, right? But God, or this, I'm sorry, Jesus set the church up. He set this process up. Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. For the perfecting, maturing of the saints. Not including myself, am I matured to the place that God wants me to be. I am maturing every day. Amen? Amen. So, I, I mean, you know, just me. The rest of you guys are perfect. Okay. <laughs> As believers, we must learn to trust the process God has laid out for us. And this process is intended for your spiritual well-being. Okay? So not, this is, God is not about trying just to, you know, rule you, control you. That's not what He's trying to free you. Make you a better you. Okay? So here, Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6. You guys know these verses. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And where is that at? Point it to it again, your mind, and lean not unto your own under. Where is it at? So can there be a battle within yourself mentally? What do you call doubts? Anybody ever doubt before? You ever have unbelief before? Yes, we all have. We've all dealt with it, right? And then this is what you call, James calls it a, a what kind of mind? Double minded. You can have a double-minded uh, double mind, and what happens is there is a breakdown in communication, thus you're ineffective on how you operate. Because you've got two opinions about something. Mm -hmm. Whose opinion are you going to listen to? Are you going to listen to the opinion of God, or the opinion of yourself, your own understanding? This does not take away from you thinking, because God gave us a mind, which is a brilliant gift, that God has blessed us with. And He intends for us to use it. But He does not intend for you to use it apart from Him. This is where we submit ourselves to God, right? right. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge Him. And what does He do? He'll direct your path. You, you want to know, because a lot of times, I think the, the majority of the time, the issues that are at hand is making decisions and making right decisions for your life. That's what matters. Because once you decide, you're in it. Once you, you, commit, you commit to it. <laughs> you're in it. The good news is that God forgives all your stupidity. Or, I'm sorry, all your iniquities. <laughs> your inequalities. Because yeah. have you ever made stupid decisions? Anybody? Yeah. We all have, but God forgives those. God forgives them. And He heals us. He heals that dis-ease. God forgives, this is Psalms 103, right? He forgives all our iniquities or inequalities, decision making that we're, in, we're not in line with His, His perfect will. Right? His purpose, right? Ultimately. And He heals all your dis-ease from the stupid decisions that we've made. So thank God for His mercies and His grace. They are forever. Uh, God is for us. God loves us. God, he, he's not tripping on what 
what mistakes you've made. He's, he wants you to start focusing in on who you are when He created you. How, how He made you to be. Amen. Don't get caught up in all, you know, all, your, all our wrong decision. He will direct your path, right? Whom's our source? Who is our source? God is. Paul used this same expression when he's talking about source. A source. We go to God. For you have not received the spirit of slavery again to fear. That's what slavery is all about. It's about fear. And of all the bondages that people contend with, it's one of the major, dis major factors when it comes to who's controlling you. Fear. Fear is a spirit. Now remember, what does 2 Timothy 1.7 say to us? God has not what? Given us what? A spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. That's what we possess today. But now the enemy wants to come in and you could have a double mind on these things. Be double-minded. This is why the fortification of the word is so important. For you have not received the spirit of slavery again to fear, but you have received the spirit of adoption by whom we cry what? Abba, Abba Father. Source, source. Because that's what the word Father means. It means source. And, and Abba is the Greek word for Father. Source, source. Galatians chapter 4, verses 6 and 7, it says, And because you are sons, God has sent forth into our hearts the spirit of His Son, crying, that we're talking now, who our Father is. God our Father, He's our source. He's our source, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer serv a servant, but a son. And if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. You're not serving God. We are not serving God. Slaves serve. Yeah. Who are we? We're heirs. We're heirs. Yeah. Technically, we're called sons and daughters. We're being served. And this is, where, this is where we have to have this balance in our life because the Bible says in Romans, it says, let everyone esteem others better than themselves. Think, think about that. If you have an esteem for someone better than you, how are you going to treat them? With love and respect. Isn't that right? And this is how we, and it doesn't allow for you to get big headed in your head, in your mind. You now are serving. Serving. It's a service. Okay? So you're no longer a servant. See what it says? I'm not saying this. The word says it. You are no longer a servant. You are not a slave. You are a son or a daughter. And if a son or daughter, then you are an heir of God through Christ. Hallelujah. Abba is the Greek word expression. Uh, expression is for father. Say, the spirit of his son, Jesus, is to acknowledge God as father. That's the spirit of his son. That's what that's in reference to. Jesus, when he was on the cross, he said what? Abba, father. He said, father, father. Remember that? Yes. When he was giving up his life for us. Yeah, because he knew who the source is. It takes the work out of the relationship with God to acknowledge him as our father. Now, him being our source, you don't have to be worried about anything. You trust him. You believe him. But that's where the problem comes in. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And that's, that's where the issue takes place. It requires agape love to keep our minds clear so that we may see clearly. Agape love has to do with a love that's based off of how God loved us first. And because he loved us first, we in turn love him. Yeah. And God loved us in spite of us. Yeah. God loves you even when you're not lovable. Yeah. Whoever says he is in the light but hates his brother is in darkness even until now. So one thing to say, I love God, but if you're hating each other, how is that going to work out? No, not at all. Keeps you blinded. Whoever loves his brother lives in the light. And in him there is no cause for stumbling. You, you can see clearly. 
But whoever hates his brother is in darkness and walks in darkness and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. And this, this happens in life, people, where there's so much hatred, you're not willing to listen to nobody. And I'm talking about relationships that people come that are in, they're in these relationships, family relationships, <laughs> and they hate each other. Yeah. Things are cut off because what? I don't believe you. I don't trust you. You are a liar. I hate you. Some pretty harsh things. Yeah. These are where, this is where we stay in this love. We stay in this position of love and forgiveness at all times. Some people are, gonna, are going to be who they are no matter what. And you're, you're not going to be able to change them. Let me tell you this. If God can't change them, what makes you think you can? It's not, it's not up to you to change anybody. The only person you have responsibility for change is who? Yourself. Is yourself. You cannot change anybody. How does that work out in, in a husband and wife's relationship when you're trying to make your wife do what you think they should be doing? How does that work out for you? Does that work? No. It's very difficult. You're going to come across a wall, guaranteed. It just doesn't work. Yeah. But even if, if, like, if you go, like, some, in some cultures, uh, a female is not even allowed to speak to the husband. Yeah. So the way to control them is shut them up. Yeah. Don't think. Don't say a word. And this is now from a religious background now. And literally religion. Not the word. Because the Bible says we are joint heirs with Christ. See, and that's the thing. You can, we can go through the scripture and, we can, and there are people who can find scripture to say that it's scriptural for the woman to keep quiet. It's a misquote. A misquote from what the Bible says. See, we're supposed to be like Adam and Eve in the beginning. They were in communication. Think about it. Eve ate of the fruit. Adam could have stopped her. How come he didn't stop her? Because she had her own mind. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Hallelujah. Okay. So now, God is love. If God is love, then love is our source. Love is our source. We begin life once we make a decision to fulfill our purpose. And remember that. The, when you think about will, it has to do with purpose, okay? So now, we, f we will face struggles along the way, but pushing through and never giving up will result in fulfillment in life. You got to push. Yep. Say, I got to push. If there's no push, then you're not going to go anywhere. Yeah. You're going to stay stuck. Yeah. It is faith that strengthens you in the fight it requires faith to be strong first timothy 6 12 says fight the good fight of faith now mind you when you read the context of this it's talking about not depend be dependent on money in that chapter it says the love of money is the root of all the love of money is the root of all evil money is not the root of all evil the love of money is the root of all evil meaning Trust in money is the root of all evil. Fight the good fight of faith, meaning I'm not going to be dependent on money. I'm going to be dependent on the one who is the supplier of the money. Amen. Who made the money in the first place? Yes. Who made the trees? God did. God did. Mm -hmm. And the money comes from where? God. From the trees. Mm -hmm. it comes from God. Yes. But that's not the point. If you're, if you're money hungry, then you got the wrong motive. Right. The motive now is fulfilling God's purpose for your life. Mm -hmm. What has God said for you to do? That requires money in order to fulfill it. Well, you got to have purpose first. Provision is provided for those who have a vision. If you have no vision, then you have what is known as division. Something's taking it away. Right? Okay. Abraham was strong in faith. 
Okay, how? And not being weak, Romans chapter 4, verse 19. And not being weak in faith, he did not consider his own body to be dead when he was about a hundred years old, nor yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He did not waver at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in what? Faith. Giving glory to God. And being fully persuaded that what God had promised, he was able to, to perform. Now, a lot of people will look at Abraham, and especially if you come from a, a Jew culture, Judaism, that Abraham is the father of faith. Right? As if he never doubted. At all. <laughs> yes, he did. Think about it. He took his half-sister, who was Sarai at the time, because she was attractive. And when he came into Egypt, what did he say to her for her to do? Say that you are my sister. Now, justifiably, he is not lying. Because of the family line where she came from. Right? But is he lying? Yes, yes he was. Even the king, the Spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit came and spoke to the king and said, You are going to pay a price for this if you touch this woman. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Now think about the time when he was about to enter into this covenant. What was, was, what was going on in his head? Because he's a man of faith, right? The father, father of faith, Abraham. But did he doubt? Yep. Think about it. This is a man who we are following, and God equated his belief in what he promised, what he promised him about the son. So Sarah, Sarai, says, you know what? Go ahead and take Hagar and have sex with her. He wasn't arguing with that. <laughs> he could have stopped it. But he says, okay. <laughs> And now we have an Ishmael. And that war is still going on in our, to our day right now. And God said, this would not be, that's what you would call the son of the flesh, right? Ishmael. Not Isaac. And God said, no. The seed is coming from your loins through Sarah's body. But did he doubt? Yes. Oh, yeah. Why, why, why did he take Hagar? Because I know what. God told me you are going to bring forth this son. Yes. But think about it. An imperfect person, still God called him a friend. God still used him. God still is using us. I'm not justifying integ lack of integrity or lying, like what we read in Psalms 24. I'm not justifying that. That's, that goes without saying. I any process of business, when you enter into a business transaction and you start compromising and living unintegral and you start lying and cheating and conniving and all these different ways to get ahead, you will pay a price for it. Saved or unsaved. Okay? But he, was he fully persuaded? When was Abraham fully persuaded? When did that happen? It happened when the covenant was cut. He told him to bring the, the animals to him. God told him to bring the animals and cut them in half. Lay their, lay the way covenant practices were, lay their bodies side by side. And a fire came and walked through them. Who was that? That was God. And from then on, Abraham didn't doubt. He was fully persuaded. So we have what we have today because of Jesus' life. And because of Jesus' life, we are fully persuaded. We believe. We are believers. And that's what God requires of us is to believe. Faith is something you possess or you have. You're not getting more faith. Like the way you have muscles. Y'all have muscles? Everybody has muscles, right? Yeah. In their bodies? Are you going to get any more muscles? Or do you the muscles you have is the muscles you have? <coughs> what do you do with those muscles? You either develop them or you let them sag. <laughs> One or the other. Depends on what you're doing with them. Right? You got to develop them. But you're not going to get any more muscles. They may get bigger. Or, or just stay there. 
It depends on what you're doing or what you're not doing. Right? We're not going to get any more faith than what we have. We have what we have and how we're supposed to live our lives. God has given us faith. Okay? So now, what was it that was Abraham's strength? It was faith. He believed what God said. What activates the God kind of faith? What makes faith work? For in Christ Jesus, this is Galatians 5, 6, and I'll stop with this because, you know. For in Christ Jesus, neither circumcision nor uncircumcision means anything but faith which works through what? Love. love. By love. Faith works by love because loving God develops trusting God. So I said all of that to say, love him and you'll trust him. If you trust him, you'll believe him. And you'll believe and trust the process. God's process. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Well, I want to thank you for taking the time to join us. I trust this has been beneficial to you. Please come at one given Sunday and join us here in a live service. Uh, if you're going to be giving to our ministry, you give through Venmo and you're giving to Faith Wired. We thank you again for being a part of our service and we're believing God's best for you in Jesus' name.